will continue feeding the tensor through the architecture, with this output serving as the input to the next C3K2 block. But here's the twist, and I hate to break it to you. This isn't actually a C3K2 block. We'll explain why shortly. Instead, it's a bottleneck block, which is highly efficient. It reduces computations by compressing features into a smaller channel depth and then expands them back to retain modeling capacity. This design emphasizes critical features, discards redundancies, and creates compact yet highly informative representations. By alternating between high and low dimensional spaces, it balances efficiency and feature refinement while preserving essential local relationships. The input arguments for this block are as follows. When the C3K2 module is initialized, these arguments map to C1 input channels, in our case 32, C2 output channels, here 64, N, the number of loops set to 1, C3K boolean, in our case set to false, and E, the expansion factor, set to 0.25. Before these arguments are fully utilized, the super dunder init function initializes the superclass, which is a C2 F module. It takes C1, C2, N shortcut, defaulting to true, since it's not explicitly defined, and the expansion factor E. This step creates the following key variables. C for the number of hidden channels and two convolutional layers, CV1 and CV2. CV1 handles channel compression, reducing the input channels. CV2 expands the channels back to their desired depth. The self.m variable, which gets initialized but is later overwritten. Once the C2F superclass initialization is complete, the C3K2 module redefines self.m as a module list. The contents of this list depend on the value of the C3K boolean. Since C3K is false, the list contains one or more bottleneck blocks, and in this case, just one, as n equals to 1. At this point, the self.c parameter from C2F is mapped to C1 and C2 of the bottleneck during initialization, representing the input and output channels, respectively. Since neither the kernel size nor the expansion factor E is explicitly provided, their default values are applied with C underscore CV1 and CV2 utilizing these defaults. Additionally, a skip connection is included because the shortcut parameter is set to true, enabling residual connections for better gradient flow and feature reuse. At this point, we finished initializing the classes, but the forward pass hasn't started yet. While you can certainly read the code, the forward pass is best understood visually. So we'll run this section for anyone interested, but we'll focus on a diagram to better explain the tensor flow. We begin with the input tensor, which is the output tensor from the previous stage. This input represents 32 feature maps at the original spatial resolution. For consistency, we will use the same naming convention as Ultralytics to enable easier cross-referencing with the code. First, the tensor passes through a one-by-one -one convolution, also known as a pointwise convolution, maintaining its shape. This operation adjusts the feature representation by learning linear combinations of the input channels, enabling more efficient and expressive feature extraction without altering the spatial dimensions. For example, let's take our input tensor with the shape 1 by 32 by 120 by 160. Here, we're applying a 1 by 1 convolution with 32 input channels and 32 output channels. So what happens during this operation? Each 1 by 1 kernel processes a single spatial location across all 32 input channels. To put it another way, imagine this 1 by 1 pixel on the input tensor. It has 32 values, one for each feature map, and we want to aggregate these 32 values into a single number for the output. Here's how it works. Each feature map value is multiplied by its corresponding weight from the kernel. The results are summed together and we add a bias term. Finally, this value is passed through the activation function to produce the output for that location. This process is repeated across all spatial locations of the input tensor. For each location, the same set of weights is applied, generating the first slice of the output tensor. Now, that's just for one output channel. Since we have 32 output channels, this operation is performed 32 times, with each channel using a unique set of 32 weights. The one-by-one -one convolution is computationally efficient and incredibly versatile. In some cases, it's used for dimensionality reduction when the number of output channels is less than the input channels, in our case, it's used for feature selection and channel mixing. 
This helps retain the most relevant information while keeping the spatial structure intact. Next, the features are split along the channel dimension into two parts, Y0 and Y1. Both Y0 and Y1 are saved unaltered for later use, while Y1 also serves as the input to the bottleneck block for further processing. In the bottleneck, the 16 features from Y1 are reduced to 8 by a 3x3 convolution. The reduction to 8 channels serves as a compression step, reducing computational cost and memory usage while retaining the most important information, and then expand it back to 16 by another 3x3 convolution. This intermediate processing allows the network to efficiently capture localized spatial features, promoting more compact and robust feature representations, the original Y1 is then added to the processed output through a skip connection. We now have three tensors of shape 1 by 16 by 120 by 160, the original Y0, the unaltered Y1, and the processed bottleneck output. These are concatenated along the channel dimension. Finally, the combined tensor passes through one last pointwise convolution, resulting in an output tensor of shape 1 by 64 by 120 by 160, ready for the next stage of the network. So let's walk through this dynamically in VS Code now. Here, the first thing we are doing is performing the first convolution, CV1. So we jump into the convolution class and return. Then we use that output to perform the tensor split. Technically, we are using the chunk function, which is a fixed channel split. This ensures the tensor's channels are evenly divided into two parts, as the code assumes the number of channels is divisible by two. We store the resulting list in Y. Next, we take the last element of this list, Y negative one, and feed it into the M module, which we now know is a bottleneck block. Let's jump into the bottleneck now. Inside the bottleneck, the first operation we perform is CV1, followed by CV2. After that, we add the skip connection X, which in our case is Y1, our input to this block. Once we're done with the bottleneck, we return to the C2F class. Since Y is a list, the Y.extend operation appends the output of the bottleneck to the list. If we had more than one bottleneck, this process would repeat for each one with the output of each, serving as the input to the next. Finally, we concatenate all the tensors inside Y along the channel dimension and feed the combined tensor into CV2, the last convolution class. This produces the final output of the C3K2 module, overriding the variable X in the process. Now that we've completed the computation, let's visualize a sample of the feature maps to see how the network is learning. These feature maps represent the learned patterns and edges at this stage of the network. The filters in this C3K2 block are designed to capture both low-level and mid-level details, gradually constructing a richer understanding of the scene as the data progresses deeper through the network. By visualizing these maps, we gain valuable insights into how the model interprets and processes the input image. Since we've already covered the convolution class, we'll step over it and move on. The goal is to go faster through familiar classes and spend more time exploring new ones. Along the way, we'll continue visualizing some feature maps. We'll step over the next two stages as they are already familiar to us. The goal is to quickly reach stage 6, where we encounter a C3K2 true module, one of the fundamental blocks of YOLO 11 that we haven't yet explored. Let's make our way there. Along the way, notice how the feature maps become increasingly abstract with more medium-level information aggregated into single pixels. 